So you've been thinking about cubism and abstraction. And my prompt for you was, why is cubism so crazy? And why does abstraction matter? Because I wanted to confront head on this feeling of, what? And why should I care about this? So this prompt asks you to do a very important and underappreciated critical thinking skill which is to simply lay out the nature of the problem, to state why it's a problem. What is the problem that we're trying to figure out? And so Andrea is suggesting that one of the problems with cubism is that it is so abrupt. There's nothing soothing in it. And then she goes on to give us a specific example, Brock's violin and palette, where she says, he takes what would normally be rounded objects and makes them angular, pointy, and then she goes for an emotional implication, almost angry. It evokes the feeling of being poked awake with the shark's sharp stick. And you can test the validity of her descriptors with your eyes. Do you see the angles? Yes. Things that are supposed to be round, and there's a little bit of roundness left in the violin, but they're interrupted by these angular protrusions that are unpleasant in the sense that this is not what we think we're supposed to get from a painting or from a violin or a still life. For fun, let me compare Brock's violin still life to one by William Harnett, who was a 19th century American painter and a master of fascinating illusionistic tricks. So here's his violin with its curving forms. And notice how it's hanging, suspended, as if we were looking not at a painting, but actually at this board with the iron brass um, tool, or what is the word I'm looking for? The hardware of the furniture from which a horseshoe is hanging and the violin is pinned with a string. Well, Brock, old joker that he is, is also got a nail with a string, as if he's making a joke about that kind of illusionistic painting. So in this, in this critical thinking work here, I'm asking you to identify a problem and then connect your thinking to that presented in your textbook, working with a quote. Here, Andrea's choosing this quote, Brock knits the various elements of violin, an artist palette, and some sheet music together into a single shifting surface of forms and colors. Why did I underline that? Because I'm looking for a moment of description that actually gets at why the spatial field of cubism is different than harnets. We don't feel as if space is shifting and we don't feel like we have a single surface. With Harnet, we feel like we're looking at a window onto a surface that can be mapped out of what's in front of what. We feel like we could take out a measuring stick and actually know exactly how many inches behind the violin this piece of sheet music is. We can sense, like, we could almost measure the rip in the tear. Is it a centimeter deep? We can't do that with Brock, with the palette or the nail in relationship to all this other stuff. We don't even know exactly what it is because it is a shifting surface of parts that seem to be also knitted together as the textbooks. And so this, the textbook here is trying to get at how you explain the, the object spatial surround relationships, the figure ground. And they say in some of the painting, these formal elements have lost not only their natural spatial relations, but their coherent shapes, a sense of loss. I'm gonna circle that word loss because we do struggle with cubism because we have a sense that we've lost our bearings because we've lost our sense of what the spatial relationships are within the artwork. And Ryan built on that when he also talked about lack, that one of the reasons we're uneasy in front of cubism is because we feel a lack of our expected 
understanding of form and space. Form being objects and bodies and space being the spatial field around them. Everything is crowded into the frame and cut into geometric pieces. I love those verbs, crowded and cut. So Ryan connects that sense of things being crowded into the frame and cut into pieces so that they don't match the reality of the object. He connects that to the Brock violin still life that Andrea was working with, but it also definitely applies to Ma Jolie. Look at all of those cut pieces and how they are crowded and jumbled. And in terms of Andrea's point about nothing soothing, nothing soft, Ma Jolie is supposed to represent my pretty one, a lover, a, a beautiful woman, and yet everything is crowded and cut into sharp, incoherent pieces that goes against the notion of beauty. And as we talk endlessly about cubism, I really appreciate Ling's point here that it's alienating to me as an average viewer, right? Someone who isn't, <laughs> doesn't make her living as a professor of art history because it is confusing. And conceptually, it tends to be overly complex and philosophical, yes. We are in an art world now where the artists are playing games with the intellectual experience of art, not just the visual experience of art. And it, it can be incredibly frustrating. And I appreciate this point. I wouldn't be able to make sense of the work, work without significant coaching or explanation by an expert. That this is not an artwork that you just can look at and enjoy and receive and feel like you can connect with without having someone kind of pro poke you along or maybe have the artwork poke you as Andrea would say. And then I wanted to say another thing about what Ling went on with. Okay, I'll keep going with the orange pencil. She, I wanted to talk about her quote. I really appreciate what Ling did and I think this is important. The quote here is Picasso and Brock reassembled they're shattered subjects. Okay, we can make sense, right, about the idea of shattered subjects. That's the cutting that Ryan was talking about. And so she's saying, here's this quote, they reassemble their shattered subjects conforming to principles of artistic composition to communicate meaning rather than to represent observed reality. And then she says, this does not make sense to me at all. I agree. It's, not, it's kind of a weak, even confusing statement. And until I listened to the Quartz's lecture on cubism, yay, I'm glad the lecture helped. And the idea of showing and deconstructing the conventions of Western art. One of the problems with cubism is that it is so hard to talk about in a way that actually is true to what you're experiencing. And yet allows you to kind of step back and sum up. I don't actually think that the step, the, the textbook summed up very well when they say that they're creating, they're conforming to principles of artistic composition to communicate meaning. What principles? Wait a minute. That seems to me fancy talk. <laughs> That's fancy talk that to me obscures what's actually going on. Certainly we know what it means to represent observed reality, observed reality, the reality of what color the violin is, what shape it has, the way light falls on it, that we understand. But I think Lin is also, excuse me, Ling is also absolutely right to kind of cast doubt on the way the textbook posits an opposition between communicating meaning as an alternative to representing observed reality. Because I don't think all of these cut, stacked, pokey, jarring pieces that are assembled together in a disorienting way are actually clearly communicating meaning to me. And that's probably what Ling feels as well. I feel like they're teasing me about meaning. I'm trying to make meaning out of the idea that, okay, there's a title, there's some words there, Ma Jolie. I can connect that to the song. I connect that to, can connect that to a woman because I see the toes. I get that this is in a portrait format. I get that this is playing at, it's providing me with something like a body because that's what Western art has been doing with all of its shading and its grids. And yet this doesn't add up to a body. So I'm actually experiencing a sense that meaning is coming, possibly coming into 
suggesting itself, but also being canceled out. That meaning is not stable. In fact, I think it's more helpful to say that what cubism does is to problematize meaning. This is a word you should know. It's actually a critical, critical thinking skill. And it's what you've actually been doing in this assignment to problematize. What's the definition? Let me use that red pen I've got going because this is important to make into or regard a is a problem requiring a solution. And then they give an example. He problematized the concept of history. It's the opposite of assuming you know. When you assume you know, you don't have to ask what's going on. When you problematize something, as in this example, you problematize and you say, what is history anyways? What are we talking about when we talk about history? You have problematized. And that is actually something that you want to learn to do in college, because that's how scholars and thinkers proceed. They take something and they set it up as a problem to investigate. They notice that something has the potential to be understood as a puzzle to figure out. And what Picasso and Brock and other cubists and avant-garde artists are doing in the early 20th century is increasingly problematizing what art is, problematizing, set, making into a puzzle, a source of confusion, a source of uncertainty, the relationship between the viewer and the artwork. 